The, the, these next, this session will not be as long as the last one, I hope. <laughs> I'll try to keep an eye on the time a little bit. You all, of course, have been studying the book of Joshua, and I don't know how much, if anything, you've gone into some of the uh, theories and so f discussions dealing with the issues in the book of Joshua. But uh, there are several critical issues that come into play as we evaluate what's happening. Again, I, I don't know how much you watch some of the History Channel stuff and some of those kind of programs, but there, there's a lot of skepticism out there about the historical integrity and accuracy of the Bible. And there are questions about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs. There are questions about uh, the children of Israel being in Egypt. Uh, and therefore, there is an intrinsic question as to did they leave Egypt? If they weren't there, uh, then they obviously didn't leave there. And if they didn't leave there, there's a question about all the Exodus issue and the Sinai experience and so forth. Now, let me say at the outset here, I do believe that the children of Israel, I do believe that there was an Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I believe that uh, the descendants of Jacob go into the land of Egypt uh, to retreat from a famine. And they are eventually enslaved in the land of Egypt to be delivered by Moses. But having said that, I do need to be honest with you that there are challenging issues as to how to deal with all of this. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that. But of course, the Bible talks about Moses coming in, being summoned, given a commission by God to go into the land of Egypt. And Moses and Aaron go before Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 5. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go that they may celebrate a festival to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh says... I don't know who the Lord is, and I won't let Israel go. And so at that point, then, all of the ten plague issues start to come into the, into the storyline. Eventually, after the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn, Pharaoh, on one level, expels the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. Uh, and then, of course, he changes his mind and pursues them. And eventually, of course, the children of Israel find themselves at Mount Sinai where the Ten Commandments are delivered and then they migrate up to Kadesh Barnea from where Moses sends the, ten spy, or the twelve spies rather, into the land of Canaan and they come back, ten spies give a negative report of the ability of Israel to conquer the land. Two spies, Joshua and Caleb, uh, assert that they were able to do so and the children of Israel sort of rise up in rebellion against Moses and the leadership and God sentences them to 40 years of wandering. I'm telling you all this for a reason. I'll come back to the why here in a moment. Now, eventually, 40 years of wandering around, they end up at the site of Shittim, which, by the way, that's a helpful pronunciation to learn if you ever teach Sunday school. It's Shittim. It's not the alternative that it looks like. Okay. <laughs> Shittim, very helpful. All right. They end up at the site of Shittim, and it's across from Jericho. And, of course, uh, a number of things happen while they're there. Eventually, Moses, of course, dies, and Joshua then takes the mantle of leadership, sends the spies, the two spies, to the city of Jericho, where they reconnoiter the city and come back with a report about how, you know, the assessment of the morale of the people and so forth. And the children of Israel cross the Jordan River and camp at Gilgal, from which then that serves as an operating point for their conquest of the city of Jericho, and then what we call the central campaign, uh, which to me is not, uh, but the central campaign usually defined as Jericho and I, uh, usually by most people pronounced AI, and then the southern campaign that goes down into the southern part of Israel, and then eventually they go up to the northern part of Israel against a coalition in the north headed by Chatzor. That's our basic storyline. And of course then after that you have the division of the, the uh, country to the various tribes which you probably found really boring in your reading. And if it didn't, then you probably didn't read it. Because uh, I know how that works. Those lists of names, particularly in Joshua 15, are a bear and a half. Anyway, a lot of the scholarly world comes along and looks at this because there's some difficulties. We have difficulty, now I'm not saying an impossibility, but we have difficulty identifying the presence of the children of Israel in the land of Egypt, in slavery. We have difficulty having evidence of their departure from the land of Egypt. We have difficulty of tracing their route through the Sinai Peninsula, as we now call it. One, we don't know the route of the Exodus. Two, we don't know where Mount Sinai for sure is. Three, we don't know where Kadesh Barnea for sure is. 
Uh, and so we don't know where they crossed the Red Sea. There's some debate, and probably many of you have heard the story about someone's found the real crossing the Red Sea site. I'm not going to go there right now. Uh, but uh, these questions are real. Well, there are several theories then that exist as to how to explain Israel's emergence. Now, I want to look at these in order of their appearance, in order of their development. Now, the first one is going to start off as the conquest. This is the biblical storyline. Uh, the biblical storyline is the one that we see in the book of Joshua. It is the one that will look at the conquest under the leadership of the man named Joshua. And footnote here, in case you're wondering, I do believe that Joshua is the one who led the children of Israel into the promised land, unless there's any question about that. And the children of Israel come from outside the land of Canaan, from Egypt, and they are going to come into the land to conquer it. Now, there's some interesting things that happen here. Uh, as we look at the narration, uh, Shittim is located up here uh, north of the Dead Sea would be about right there and Jericho is almost directly across from it down in this grayish area of the Arava as it is sometimes referred to. And this is the story that you've read out of the book of Joshua and I'll simply give you a basic line of attack. All right, now watch the arrows as they go. There's the southern campaign and the northern campaign and then they come back. And of course you want to see that again. I do. Wait, wait, didn't want to go there. All right, here we go again. Southern campaign, northern campaign, and then they're back. And from there then they divide the country up. This essentially is the geography and everything that you've read out of the book of Joshua. Well, again, part of the problem that arises is the difficulty of tracing a lot of this. Uh, one of the problems has to do with the city of Jericho, which we're going to talk about here after a while. Uh, if you watch the latest program that I've seen on television is one very well produced. Uh, I, I don't agree with all of it, but one very well produced called uh, Digging Up the Bible Secrets or something like that. I forget exactly the title. But it was aired the week before Thanksgiving, I think. And uh, very well done, very well done. Aired on PBS. And my major professor in this talks about, if we look at the list of the cities that Joshua's described as conquering in Joshua chapter 12, we can go to most of these sites and either one, they weren't occupied, or two, we can't find a destruction level associated with the site, and so forth. And this is sort of the standard line that exists. Now, with all due respect to my major professor, whom, by the way, I appreciate very, very much, I am fearful that he's overreading the text. Because one of the problems that occurs is that the text does not describe all of these towns being conquered. The text talks in terms of the people being killed in one way or another. But yet at the same time, the book of Joshua, and particularly going into Judges, will talk about remnants and peoples of the population that remain among them. And Joshua's going to warn them at the end of his life, don't you come back and intermarry among these people that remain among you, because they'll become thorns in your eyes and you know, pains in your sides or something like that, uh, and uh, they're going to pull you away from the Lord. But furthermore, if we actually look at the cities in the book of Joshua and Judges, the conquest part of Judges, not the main narrative of Judges. But if we look at the conquest part of Judges, and that includes basically chapter 1, there are only four towns that are described as being physically destroyed. Only four. One of them is Jericho, a second one is Ai, a third one is Chatzor, and the fourth one, which appears in Judges, is Jerusalem. None of the other towns are described as being destroyed, at least in the same way. Now, it does talk about the cities destroyed, but there's a nuance there. When you look at the, the dynamic of what is involved in destroying a city, physically, Jeruc Jericho is burned, I is burned, Chatzor is burned, and you have Jericho, uh, Jerusalem being destroyed and Judges. But elsewhere, elsewhere in the Bible, in the book of Exodus, for instance, God will tell the children of Israel, and in the book of Deuteronomy, you're going to come into the country and you're going to live in towns you did not build. 
You're going to eat from groves that you did not plant. You're going to drink from wells that you did not dig. And you think about what's being described here. It is a displacement of the population, not a physical destruction of the cities. And I fear that sometimes the book of Joshua is overread when that narration in Judges chapter 12, or excuse me, Joshua chapter 12 talks about, and they kill the king of Megiddo one, and the king of this one, and the king of another, and the read that all of these towns are physically wiped out. The text doesn't tell us that. The enemy are not the buildings. The enemy are not the fortification systems. The enemy are the people. And if the children of Israel can fight against the people away from the towns or minimally perhaps have to approach the town and maybe breach a wall in one location without destroying the entire town, they've accomplished the very goal that they're wanting to do, to live in houses they hadn't built and to drink from wells they hadn't dug and so forth. And this is an important point that apparently a lot of folks don't read real carefully. But because of some of these kinds of questions, because of the challenge of finding evidence, and I, I grant it's a challenge, but there's an excellent book, two excellent books written by James Hoffmeyer from Trinity University, one Israel and Egypt and another Israel and Sinai, in which he talks about very carefully, published by Oxford University Press, talks very carefully about the circumstantial evidence that points to Israel in Egypt and Israel in Sinai, we can't just cavalierly and casually set this aside and say they were not there. Now there's another factor that comes into the picture. If you have your Bibles with you, I want you to read this. Now I realize full well that a lot of uh, our skeptical and liberal scholars will not subscribe to this because for many of them they've already written off the idea of a miracle. That is part of the historiographic presupposition that characterizes a lot of modern scholarship. There's a statement, there are two statements in the book of Deuteronomy that are intriguing as they might impinge upon this question. One of them is in Deuteronomy chapter 8. They say basically the same thing, but it's twice in the narrative. And God is reminding the children of Israel, this is in verse 4, telling them, Your clothing did not wear out on you, and your foot did not swell these forty years. I'm not totally sure what the foot not swelling means, <laughs> but I do know what your clothes didn't wear out mean. Unless there's really some cryptic significance to this that totally escapes me. But what does that communicate? To me it communicates that there is some kind of supernatural intervention of preservation that's involved. Turn over to Deuteronomy 29 verse 5. A similar kind of statement that God has, speaking through Moses, I have led you forty years in the wilderness, your clothes have not worn out on you, and your sandals have not worn off your feet. Again, some supernatural, if you want to call it that, preservation of their goods. Now, I don't know if you've ever been camping or not. Uh, I haven't done a lot of it. I've moved a lot. Okay, I could, I, that's the closest thing to camping that I've typically done with any regularity. And all of you, or probably most of you, coming to Harding to school here had to sort of move. And you probably discovered that if you didn't pack real well, some of your stuff got broke. But anticipating the likelihood of it breaking, you probably put bubble wrap on it, wrapped it in blankets, and you know, stuffed it in the suitcase around all the clothes and all that kind of junk. And hopefully you got here with all those breakable things fairly well intact without any damage. I'm not going to ask, ask for a poll here. But imagine carrying a bunch of jars, such as I had in here earlier, on donkeys for 40 years. Chances a lot of those aren't going to survive very well. So my question here is, what are we going to go in the wilderness to look for and expect to find? If God is preserving them in some sort of a supernatural kind of way, what should we go in the wilderness to expect to find? Now, admittedly, a person who's already written off the idea of any kind of supernatural intervention is going to write this off as saying it's irrelevant. You know, I'm reading into the text. Well, this is sort of what the text says, though. And admittedly, there's a presuppositional issue that plays into this, and I, I grant that. But the question still comes up. What would you go expect to find if this has any viability at all? 
I can't fully answer that. But this is the kind of problem that arises. As the scholars come along and they have difficulty finding evidence of Israel in Egypt, they have difficulty finding evidence of Israel in the wilderness, they have difficulty finding evidence of destruction of all these cities that are listed in jo Joshua, but then again, Joshua isn't narr narrating that as a reality, at least not in the way we often read it. So other theories have popped into the picture as we try to evaluate this. One of these was known as the peaceful infiltration, formulated essentially by Martin Note and George Mendenhall. And uh, they argue that what happened was that you had some people coming from outside the land of Israel, and the title basically is sort of self-explanatory. They come in peacefully from the outside. That's why the term infiltration. Now to put some sort of a parallel on this, we, have, we live in Circe. Uh, down the road here in the northeasterly direction is Bald Knob. Uh, off to the west is Rosebud. Uh, off to the southeast is Higginson. And further is Desark and so forth. And the image would be that these outsiders, the Israelites, have moved in. They've not settled in Circe and Bald Knob and Rosebud and Higginson and Desark. They've settled in the area between Circe and Rosebud and between Circe and Bald Knob and between. Now, once they settle in over a period of time, what's going to begin to happen? You begin to intermarry, you know, sort of the swapping of the goods. Uh, I, you've got something I need, so let's trade a little bit and swap our resources. And the children get to know each other and sort of there begins to develop an intermarriage, which is almost inevitable. This is essentially the peaceful infiltration. Now these people are thought to have been out in the wilderness and they bring with them this new concept of God and that sort of takes root in the population mindset and things then begin to develop into the later development of Israel. Well, the settling between the towns, the slow intermarrying and all of that is sort of the characteristic of the peaceful infiltration. Now, the way this would set up to give some sort of a graphic portrayal, you have them coming in from different areas and they eventually move into the country and settle in those open areas and eventually they begin to intermarry and they sort of take root and sort of take over. And eventually then you have the judges and then eventually, of course, the Saul uh, and then David and Solomon and so forth. Well, over a period of time, uh, there are some challenges as to the viability of this. And another theory comes under the scene, the peasant revolt. Well, again, the title here is sort of self-explanatory. Uh, the peasants are the ones who rise up in rebellion against their oppressive overlords, and they are revolting against them. That's the rebellion. As you look at this, uh, the formulator of this is a fellow named Norman Gottwald, who is a self uh, essentially a self-proclaimed socialist and he uses Marx's theory to explain the dynamics that are involved here and as you read his book uh, Tribes of Yahweh you hear all of this resonance of socialism and Marxism and so forth that play into it. The argument is that the people of Canaan are oppressed. Now there's a reference here to the Amarna period. The Amarna tablets are a collection of uh, tablets, cuneiform Akkadian, that were discovered down in the land of Egypt, that a lot of them are letters from rulers in the land of Canaan writing down to the Egyptian overlords and either complaining about their neighbors or asking for help or whatever. But some of those letters are also copies of ones apparently that were sent back to Canaan saying, okay, send me uh, your tribute, uh, send me gold, send me virgins, send me concubines, send me furniture, send me this, that, and the other. And of course the inevitable question that arises is where is the monarch, say the king of Shechem or the king of Gezer or wherever, where are they going to get all this stuff? Well, they're going to take it from the you and me's in the culture. So they come and take, you know, our daughters and they come and take our taxes and they come and take our furniture. Uh, they might contribute some out of their own court, but to a large extent it is taken from the populace. This is the way taxes tend to work, in case you haven't noticed. And after a period of time, the population in this scenario gets fed up with it. We're not going to take it anymore. And they begin to retreat into the countryside. And there are references in this Amarna literature to these folks known as the Apiru, who are out in the uh, open areas and are occasionally performing raids and attacks on the establishment. And so 
Gutball comes along and he sees these as the core components that will become the Israelites as they then develop a different mindset and rise up in rebellion against their overlords and take over. Now, of course, this doesn't mesh very well with the biblical text. There's not much congruence in this theory with what you read out of the book of Joshua. So most people that tend to believe the Bible with a, a high element, a high view of Scripture, don't generally buy into this, or at least certainly not much of it. Well, eventually there's another theory that comes on the scene. Oh, that was the portrayal of how it works. Let me back up here. Uh, that went too far again. Watch the arrows. This was hard to do. They're, they're going all over the place, but notice they don't go outside the country. They're just sort of meandering around fighting against each other. All right. The next one is what I call the symbiotic. I don't know that there's a formal term that's come to be associated with this, but the formulator of this theory basically is Israel Finkelstein of Tel Aviv University. Very nice fellow, uh, very strong in his advocacy of this, but he's a very, uh, in my opinion, a very kind individual. He basically argues that the Israelites are a group of folks that because of some sort of a pressure that arose in the land of Canaan, whether it is warfare, whether it is uh, plague, whether it is uh, environmental, you know, so weather patterns mess up, some of the people leave the interior of Canaan and go off into the periphery across the Jordan and live there for an indeterminate period of time perhaps hundreds of years. But then after those period of times, and maybe even having some contact, maintaining some contact with the folks back home. Now if we think in terms of our own United States, for instance, back in the early history of the U.S. and the Great Western Movement and so forth, folks would be leaving the eastern seaboard and get in their covered wagons and move out west and maybe never see the old uh, family back home again, but maybe maintain some correspondence. You know, it's not the best parallel, but the reality of this kind of thing occurs. And so Finkelstein is basically suggested because of some sort of a stress, whatever it is, whether it's warfare, whether it's environmental, whether it is a plague or whatever the circumstances, some of the folks leave the land of Canaan, go off into the periphery and live as sojourners off who knows where and eventually, maybe hundreds of years later, come back. Well, this is a more peaceful kind of approach and there are certain elements that seem to fit uh, and we'll come back to an element of that in a moment. You might recognize there is some resonance of this, even with the storyline in the Bible, isn't there? When you think in terms of why did the family of Jacob leave the land of Canaan to go to Egypt? Nobody's answering. It was a famine. It was an environmental stress issue in the land of Canaan. So they go down into the land of Egypt and they remain there hundreds of years, eventually to return. So there are elements of viability that mesh a little bit anyway with the Bible storyline. I have trouble just wholesale kicking him out of the picture because there are elements of compliance and correspondence that come into the picture. Here's the portrayal of their departure, leaving the land of Canaan for whatever reason, going out in the periphery, not necessarily knowing where. He does not argue they go to Egypt. I want to be clear about that. He does not argue they go to Egypt but at least the biblical storyline has them leaving because of similar crisis and going to Egypt. Well, and then over a period of time you have them eventually returning. So the blue lines have them coming back. Notice they come back a whole lot quicker than they left. Uh, that wasn't meant to be, but it's the way the arrows went. Now the symbiotic has to do with there is a, a bi-directional relationship here of some kind. They don't totally lose ties with the folks back home. All right, the next theory is what I refer to as the eclectic one. I'm not going to say I'm the formulator of this. Uh, I don't know that I'm necessarily original with this, but I really haven't seen anybody really systematically lay this out. And as is the case with the term eclectic, that means combination of at least a number of them. And so what I want to suggest is that I want to take not because I simply want to, but 
I think viably we can take elements of a number of these and see reflections of them in the biblical text. For instance, the symbiotic. You have the children of Israel leaving the land of Canaan because of some environmental stress. They eventually return. Now one of the questions that arises is, were there any family left in the land of Canaan? Now, I don't know if you remember that first scenario, the conquest picture. If you read the narrative carefully, and sometimes, aye, there's the rub. If you read the text carefully, there is no campaign described in the land of Canaan, basically north of Gibeon and south of the Jezreel Valley, including the area around Shechem. To the contrary, the children of Israel seem to sort of run all over the place in the middle part of the country, and yet all of the evidence is, is that Shechem is occupied. We have the Amarna letters of king from Shechem. We have uh, the children of Israel when they leave uh, Gilgal or leave Ai, they go up to Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal and have this covenant renewal ceremony. Shechem is right at the foot of the two mountains. No discussion whatsoever of their conquest of this. And if one of the points of the book of Joshua is to emphasize God giving the land to the children of Israel, why is there no description of a campaign in that central part of the country? Well, I don't have an answer for that. I have a theory for that. Or maybe better, I should say, a hypothesis. Theories are usually a stronger sense. But I have a hypothesis. When we think in terms of the children of Israel, uh, back in the book of Exodus, going down into the land of Canaan, or going down into the land of Egypt, and how long is the famine? It's seven years. They get to the land of Egypt two years into the famine, so basically only five years of the famine left. We have a tendency, and I understand why, we have a tendency simply to read the narrative on the assumption that once the famine's over, everybody stays down in the land of Egypt. Maybe. Maybe. Hear that word? Maybe. <laughs> Some of them returned to the land of Canaan and settled around Shechem. Now, there's some other reasons why I could suggest this, but I don't have time to go into it. So that when the children of Israel do return under Moses' leadership and Joshua's, maybe the folks around Shechem in the middle part of the country are kin. And this could answer some of the other questions archaeologically that some of the scholars will occasionally pose. You think in terms of, uh, we can't go much with the peasant revolt, but you do have the intermarrying ele element that is sort of implied with the pact that is drawn up with the people of Gibeon. Remember, the Gibeonites come down and they make an agreement with the children of Israel. You know, please, when you get to our territory, don't fight against us and don't kill us. And of course, the book of Joshua, or excuse me, the book of Judges clearly talks in terms of not all the Canaanites are driven out anyway. So you have the elements of the resident population remain among them for whatever reason. Now, I would argue that there is a conquest component. And that's what, the God, that's what God is emphasizing, that he is the one who's engineering and in charge of all of this. But the problem is the children of Israel don't follow his will very well. I would argue that Joshua is indicating God has given them the land on the condition that they listen to him and that Judges is accentuating the covenant failure. Israel's refusal to follow God's instruction. And hence all of the problems enter into the picture. Now as we think in terms of a chart that sort of summarizes this, what I've tried to do is put this in some sort of an organized comparative strategy. So you have the conquest theory. Is it military? Yes. That's sort of the primary focal point that is, serves as the catalyst. Is it peaceful? Obviously no. You have the description in the book of Joshua of a conquest move going around killing the people and so forth. Do they come from outside the land of Canaan? Yes, they cross over after their wandering and eventually cross at Jericho entering into the promised land. And they do not come from inside. The peaceful infiltration has the indication of whether it's yes or no and so forth down the line. Now the last two will have some mixture in those last two categories. And maybe this can sort of quickly summarize some of the issues that are going on. The whole discussion of the emergence of Israel is still up in the air. You go to Israel today and there are a lot of scholars, a lot of Israeli scholars that will argue the, the Israelites were not in the land of Egypt. And they will basically argue there was no Moses, there was no Ten Commandments. 
and all that we have are the Israelites of antiquity are just sort of outgrowths of the Canaanites. Which raises some really interesting questions politically. Especially as people will try to argue the promised land concept as it now is viewed. Palestinians are coming along with similar claims and saying we're related either to the resident Canaanites or the Philistines of all people. Staking their precedence of existence and staking out their territory accordingly. There's a lot of volatility in this discussion. Any quick questions? Or are there such a thing as a quick question? I bet you didn't realize how complex this was. But this is the kind of thing that you do eventually encounter. If you keep your eyes and look at some of these articles, keep your eyes open and look at some of the articles in Time Magazine, US News, Newsweek, History Channel, and so forth, you'll see resonances of this in a number of those sources. And I think it's important for you at least to be aware of what's going on and why these theories are bouncing around out there. Anyway, thank you. That concludes this discussion.